presenter for the afternoon is Zachary Barbara from American Megatrends, and I'll let him introduce his topic. Um, take it away. Thank you, Dick. So, as Dick mentioned, I am Zachary Barbara from American Megatrends. We're going to be covering uh, pretty much a now topic of pre-boot provisioning solutions within UEFI and some of the problems the industry is facing today without these. So we'll start with a brief introduction, then go through some of the specification changes that you can build on top of to create some of these solutions. Then we're going to go over an expanding further section of where you can go even further by developing more advanced solutions, and then a call to action at the end. So, introduction. Current challenges for provisioning. Uh, UEFI systems are being deployed in massive numbers today. And more and more corporations and data centers want to introduce corporate policies on how these machines have to be configured. Systems crash in the, in the field, in the data center, in, within corporations, and traditional recovery net mechanisms of using a CD or a recovery partition don't always work. <clears throat> as we know, security is a hot topic these days. So as OS updates and firmware updates come out, they need to be deployed globally and quickly so that the systems are patched properly. And provisioning utilities on a disk are susceptible to malware attacks and even corruption via viruses, so that the disk is not always the best place to be keeping these. So it leads us to why can't a feature-rich provisioning environment be included into the firmware stack in the BIOS chip? So firmware-based provisioning, it's already included in the flash part. If you did include it in external media, it would also need to be provisioned in the factory, so it adds an extra step if you had it on external media already. Firmware has access to lots more information than it's handed off to the OS. As most people in here are members of USWG and PIWG, you know there's a, a large amount of information that disappears when exit boot services occurs. So doing it at a later time doesn't always fit. And as the root of trust, the firmware is the most secure part of the platform. And it also should be protecting itself properly so that things can't attack it or insert code into the firmware. And you have to trust the firmware because it's the first thing that gets control once the CPU releases uh, reset. So UEFI 2.5 helps make it easier. Uh, FMP was expanded uh, in earlier versions, but also highlighted in 2.5, can now be both code and data. So it isn't just something the firmware has to understand, it can also execute. And it being signed can also be considered uh, verified. System configuration data has been expanded through the X UEFI language and the mappings so that information can be known about the layout of the system configuration data from beyond the, the firmware itself. And a big one was the network support was greatly expanded in the UEFI 2.5 specification, allowing you now a complete network stack that also gives you access to not only your local network, but the internet if you wanted to. So now we'll expand on the topics in the specification. So FMP, capsules can now be code and data. So if you want to manage other firmware on the platform for say option ROMs or other hardware on the platform, you don't need to contain the flashing code for that. You still have to publish that these other firmwares exist, but the actual firmware management protocol instance can come from the device itself. So it saves on boot time because you don't need to run ex uh, external code that's unnecessary. And it also saves on the ROM size because we don't need to include that code. FMP allows the external devices to manage their own security. So you don't need to uh, be handling all security of the platform for those devices. But on the flip side, UEFI does provide certain protocols that the firmware can depend upon to help verify its images. So there's space saving for that there as well. 
And updating via capsule, because of how there is a system reset that occurs, will verify that the system is in a secure state. All the software that is loaded can be verified and considered secure. So it is the most secure method of doing an update known today. So just a little build or graphic on this. You've got a firmware capsule. You've got your system firmware that boots up. It will discover and verify that capsule. The capsule will then gain control. The capsule can then go out and find its external device, go ahead, verify its own information, go through its update, and update the firmware. So this could be an option ROM card. This could be a touchscreen controller on I2C. This could be a CPLD. It could be any device on the firmware today, or I mean on the platform today. So system configuration uh, changes. So the XUEFI mapping was added to the specification in UEFI 2.5 that allows you to have certain options be tied to a master list that's known by everybody uh, in firmware development. The new mapping allows for migration of current firmware settings from machine to machine. So if you have your machine A that's configured the way you want it, you can then redeploy it across all machines in the, in the data center or in your corporate world. Um, current configuration or migration of current configuration can be supplied via updates more easily now. So if the firmware configuration layout has changed for the setup data, you can apply the current settings to the future settings even if offsets changed or the layout of it changed. If you want to have a subset of your configuration data, have a common look and feel across manufacturers, say you're an OCP, uh, or OCP company, and you only have, say, six or seven settings that you want to change normally, you can get it from a number of different manufacturers, but supply a common interface for changing those. And external agents within the OS can also use an OEM provi proprietary method to uh, change those settings. And this is just a note. Operom vendors and other IHVs that are producing setup related questions should also be providing these similar mappings for all of their settings so that migration can happen, so that these can be edited externally. Basically, HII as it stands is specification defined, so everybody can get involved in this. So, another basic graphic. You've got your system. It exports its configuration maybe to a file. Uh, you've got another machine that will import that file for the configuration. And then it will go through, you can have another application that verifies this system configuration data was changed properly. HTTP support. So UEFI 2.5 pretty much built on top of the data that was already there to provide a complete client-side stack of HTTP. So at this point, the system can go out and check on the network. Do I have any firmware updates pending? Do I need to change any of my configuration data? And download any OS image updates or other updates to the platform that are available. So you can see with all these pieces, you can really start to have the platform work within the data center on the low level and the high level. You don't need to uh, be constantly developing OEM proprietary methods. And the server that provides the information can be at the data center, in your corporate firewall in a different building if you wanted, at the ODM. It can be anywhere on the internet with the abilities that are provided by the specification. No need for the recovery CD or the recovery partition anymore or to have somebody remotely provision the machine. All of this can happen on the fly. So another basic build of where you've got your system, you turn it on. During the boot process, it will check with the server to see if there's any updates for the BIOS or the firmware, configuration of the firmware, or any OS pending updates as well and then the server will push back any updates that needed to be supplied. Advanced networking support. So for the security conscious, 
uh, UEFI provides the ability to build on top of HTTP to expand to more security, uh, more secure environments. So the specification provides the ability to do a VPN through IPsec and also has the protocols defined for that. So if you want to set up your own virtual private network, you can do that very simply. Also using services like KMS, the key management, uh, on top of the UEFI network stack for HTTP and TLS, you can create a secure environment where nobody can snoop on the data as well and you can consider all communication to be secure in that method. So if there's some rogue agent on the network because it's a shared data center or something like that, you can fully lock down all communication of your platform. So where can we go further with this now? So system diagnostics, this is always an issue for machines in the field. How can you tell what broke on a platform when the system's not running correctly? Uh, UEFI provides many abstraction layers for you to be able to test block I.O., graphics console out, uh, all of these different interfaces for the mouse, the keyboard, everything's there for you to be able to test it. So you can create some very feature rich diagnostic environments. Here's just a couple slides of some stuff that AMI's developed over the years. There's a text based one or even a feature rich graphical one that will help guide the user through what's going on. So you can say troubleshoot my PC. You can have questions behind that saying my computer's blue screening. So the tests on the back end are going to be chosen to test the hard drive or to verify the OS loader. You can do these sorts of things directly built on top of UEFI. And as long as IHVs with their option ROM are going to provide the driver diagnostic protocol, this can be easily expanded without any changes to your utility. The driver diagnostic protocol will provide default implementations for you to check on the card and it will run internal diagnostics to make sure things are running correctly as well. All of this will help lead to the, the owner or user of the machine to be able to find out what's wrong with it before they even contact tech support. System auto recovery. So there was an addition in the UEFI spec 2.5 on top of OS indications where the operating system can basically inform the firmware of a catastrophic failure within the operating system. It's tried to do its own recovery. It's incapable of doing that. It can say start platform recovery. So then this can initiate an internal response within the firmware to go out and get the proper information. So common image, the blue screen of a machine, uh, the OS requests recovery back to the uh, firmware. The firmware will go out and find the provisioning server in the data center or in the corporate network. And it will load the recovery image directly back to the platform. And then you've got your platform back in a working state. So in these cloud type of environments of where the machines are just interchangeable cogs, they can go down. You can then go ahead and fix a machine that went down without ever having to initiate uh, any real tech support or anybody being involved. So system auto provision, that's also there. As the systems come from the ODM, you need to go through and make the changes that you need to your platform. Whether it be updating firmware, whether it be putting the proper OS image on there that you need, or anything along those lines. So you get your computer, it expands out. The firmware finds the same provisioning server we've been discussing. On the provisioning server, you've got your operating system, any firmware updates that you're looking to push, or any configuration data. And it will, it will go ahead, oh, the animation skipped, but did I skip it? No. Basically, it will push all of those changes to the system. There it goes. I'm glad I went back for it. Exactly. And now you've got a provision system properly. So the questions or the call to action is add-on card vendors and third-party hardware vendors should provide FMP and diagnostic capabilities. All firmware that provides HII configuration data should be providing the mapping languages for XUEFI. 
And OEMs need to realize that they need to be a solution provider in here. They need to provide solutions for configuration, provisioning, recovery, and diagnostics. Otherwise, another OEM is going to develop these and they're going to become more popular. So they need to realize becoming a solution provider will help them in these markets really set themselves apart from their competition. So it was a little bit short, I know, but you guys don't want to interrupt your lunch too much, but that's all I've got.